Please welcome Chris. Jeff, thank you very much. Hi, everybody. My name's Chris. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I, you know, this is this is a really, really well run uh, event. Uh, you know, I, I really want to uh, send a shout out to everybody who's been part of this. I know how much work everyone put in. And, you know, you don't get entertainment very much on these. And, you know, we're, we're, we really are special people. I, you know, I can picture it. Well, we're supposed, you know, we got to do some kind of entertainment. You know, what should we do? Well, how about insanity and death? You know, that would be a really good topic to, to, to bring. You know, we, we really are special people. Uh, and uh, I, I include myself in that uh, classification. Anyway, I, I am alcoholic. Uh, uh, on or around December 28th, 1989, um, the grace of God separated me from alcohol uh, for the last time. And, and uh, I struggled my way back into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was, it was certainly not easy. It was, uh, it was a bit of struggle in, in, in the beginning. But I want to talk just briefly about my alcoholism and what that, what that looked like. I, uh, there, there was, there was some things about me that I believe made me very, very susceptible to alcoholism. And some of those things were, uh, growing up, I just felt disconnected from what was going on. I didn't feel connected to the people. I always had a sense of, uh, of self-centered fear. I, I didn't know, know what it was, but I was, I was always uncomfortable with myself and my environment. And, and I found it very difficult uh, to have relationships with people. I always felt like I was on the outside of the house looking through the window at everybody else who's living their life. And I think that made me very, very susceptible for alcoholism because um, one day, I think it was 1969, uh, me and a couple of my friends decided we were going to cut school and we were going to go back to my house and we were going to get drunk. This, this was going to be cool, you know. Uh, we, we'd heard about this from some of the older kids and we'd seen it on TV. And so that's what we did. We cut school. We went back to my house and I grabbed a bottle of Four Roses whiskey uh, uh, from the top shelf in the closet, blew the dust off of it, uh, took three water glasses and poured them full of Four Roses whiskey and handed them out. I had one and my two friends had one. Now, the interesting thing about what happened with my two friends were, were they, they drank like probably normal people drank. I, I, I'm not familiar very much with how normal people drink, but I saw how they did it. They drank about half of their glass, maybe a little bit more, and they'd had enough. <laughs> no more for me, thanks. I've had enough. I, I, if, whenever I drank with people like that later on, it was the last time I ever, I ever bothered drinking with them. But they did it. They pushed the glass back and they watched the show because, because what happened with me was I drank my glass, I finished off their glass, and I did as much damage to the bottle as I could. And I went into my first blackout at 13 years old. And then I came to in a field, not knowing how I got there, you know, with the missing four hours uh, that I didn't, I wasn't able to account for uh, and, and uh, staggered back into the house. And then I was violently ill for two days. Now, that was my experience with alcohol. The other two guys had half a glass, and they probably went home and had dinner with their family. Uh, me, I go into a blackout, and, and I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm so sick, I have to remain horizontal for two days. Now, if it was, you know, if it was a normal food or beverage, and I had that experience, I would be, I would stay so far away from something like that. I would never touch that stuff again. But I want, I want to tell you, I want to tell you about my alcoholism. Alcohol did something for me. I think alcohol does something to anybody that drinks it. You know, there's some al -Anons on here. Uh, you know, alcohol will do something to you too if you start drinking it. You know what I mean? You'll get in trouble too. 
But uh, but alcohol does something for me as an alcoholic. And what it did was it connected me to everything. Everything that was wrong in my life was made right by that alcohol. It took away the fear. It took away the anxiety. And it gave me an overinflated sense of confidence. You know, I, you know, I can remember, you guys, you guys, this is great. You guys are my best friends. This is so cool. This is great. You know, I never had felt that good in my life from what that alcohol did for me. But it not only made me feel good, it connected me in a way I had felt disconnected to the world. I felt like I fit in. I felt like I was a part of. I didn't feel like an outsider uh, anymore. And that's what alcohol did for me. And I'm really sick for two days. I'm really sick. But I'm thinking, I'm going to do this again. <laughs> you know, I'm good. And, and, and I did. Uh, I, I did. I, I started to become preoccupied with alcohol from that moment forward. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I never drank four roses whiskey again. You know, you know how we blame, you know, uh, uh, alcohol uh, consequences on, you know, things that really aren't the problem. Uh, I blamed getting sick on Canadian whiskey. You know, so I started to explore other forms of alcohol that 13 year olds were drinking. There was this company that had a marvelous line of products uh, called Boone's Farm. And they had the perfect kind of alcohol for 13 year olds, you know, like Strawberry Hill and, and apple wine. And then I discovered the Blackberry Brandy and the Southern Comfort, you know, and, and the Budweiser beer. And I started exploring all these things and I started to manage my drinking, you know, from a very early age, it started to, you know, it didn't seem like other people needed to manage it, but I always needed to know how many beers, you know, or do I, have, do I have, I don't care how many you have, how many beers do I have, you know, how long are we going to be out, you know, are we going to be driving by a liquor store later, I, I all, I, from the get-go, I started to manage uh, my my drinking and, and I became really really preoccupied uh, with it and from the beginning from the beginning it was difficult to manage uh, I tried to manage my drinking by drinking things that didn't have a lot of alcohol in it because I found when somebody would hand me a bottle of Southern Comfort or, or we do uh, tequila sunrises or something I would be, I would become overserved very, very quickly, and uh, and 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 trouble would soon follow. You know what I mean? So, so from an early age, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to uh, trying to manage my drinking by by pacing myself. It didn't seem like the guys that I was hanging out with had to do any of this. It's another thing that made me feel different than everybody else. You know. So, uh, so, so here I am, uh, you know, I, sh I show up in high school and I'm, uh, I'm partying like, uh, like a maniac uh, in, in high school. I, I, uh, I, I don't remember very much of it at all, but I, but I do, I do remember some of the problems like uh, right out of the gate, uh, I started to have some consequences to my drinking. I would, uh, I would drive while drinking, you know, I always felt like, uh, I always felt more confident, you know, with a really big buzz on to get behind the wheel. And, it, it, you know, in the course of my, my brief periods of time driving, because, I, you know, they would take my license away a lot. Uh, I, I crashed nine cars in, in, in drunken blackouts. I was a, the, the, the final owner of every, you know, my sponsor had to, uh, had to teach me how to sell a car when it finally came to that, you know, in my mid thirties, uh, because I never sold the car. I handed the title to the junk man, you know, and, uh, and that, that caused some problems, but, but, uh, it, you know, it was, it, it, it seemed like, it seemed to me, uh, like I just was partying, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just, I'm just, I'm a partier, uh, and 
it almost felt normal, you know, in, in the, uh, in the doctor's opinion, it, it, it talks about the alcoholic not being able to really know the truth from the false, you know, his alcoholic life seems the only normal one. And that's kind of the way it was for me too. And I found that I would tend to hang out with people who were in trouble with, you know, drugs or alcohol, uh, as, as well as, as I was, you know, and, uh, because it was the late sixties, early seventies, when I started partying, there were, you know, there, there were some other things out there that you could get in trouble with. And, uh, and I, I engaged in some of those, if you can imagine, like, uh, most of the time, when I look back on it, uh, any of the drugs that I used, I, I used them alcoholically and I used them to help me manage my alcoholism. So I'll just give you a, for instance, I, I would, I would, uh, I would, I would smoke pot so I didn't have to drink. That only worked for a short period of time. Uh, I would get uh, benzos and downers uh, to handle the hangovers. And I would use, uh, I would use cocaine or speed or whatever to be able to drink longer. So when you, when you look at all that, it was part of the management of the beast that was my alcoholism. And you cross, if, you, if you're alcoholic, you, you cross a line somewhere. And, and what the line is, uh, is it's a line that gets crossed most of the time uh, uh, before it's, before you realize you're crossing a line. And what the line is, is uh, the second part of the first step is the mental obsession. The second part of the first step really is the powerlessness that we admit to in step one. And, and how that presents with me is no matter how much I want to separate from alcohol, I can't. No matter how many times I say to myself, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to give this up. You know, you know, I, I, I don't want a fourth DUI, you know, she said she's going to leave if she ever smells it in, on my voice again, you know, the judge said, you know, the boss said, and no matter how many times I would say, okay, okay, you know, no big deal, no big deal, you know, I won't drink anymore. If, if it's that important to you, I won't drink anymore. And in a very short period of time, alcohol was going back down my throat. And it says, it says, you know, it says in uh, more about alcoholism and there is a solution. There's great examples of it. Uh, trivial excuses, you know, trivial. Okay. I swore on a Bible to my whole family, the judge and my boss that I would never drink again, but the Yankees lost. You, you know, or something like that, you know, like a trivial excuse. And I would be, I would be drinking again. It's, it's the insanity that is, is mentioned in step two that I need to be restored to. I need to be restored to sanity. Now, now there may have been a time where I could have done something about my drinking. I could have moderated. I could have stopped maybe but I crossed the line into full-blown alcoholism before I even gave it a shot. And so, so a lot of things, a lot of things happened in my life. A lot of consequences. I, I mean, I'm not a stupid person, but boy, oh boy, I could fill a book on the stupid things that I did. You know, I'm not a bad person. I don't believe, but I could fill a book <laughs> with the bad things that I did, you know, uh, and the, the people that I let down and, and, and the times, you know, that I didn't come through on commitments or, what, or wasn't able to show up. I mean, that's probably the biggest thing. I was not able to show up for the people I cared about and that needed me. So I did things like start a family and, you know, 12 months later, it's like the Hindenburg blown to bits. Uh, I, you know, I would start a career, or I would go to college or I would, you know, I would do something and, and it would just, it would just explode because, because the alcoholism was just washing over it, you know, like a tsunami. And, and I could, I could never stay consistent with anything. And, uh, and what happened was, you know, one day, 
Uh, when I'm living down in uh, Florida, and, and uh, one one day it kind of dawns on me. I, I got warrants out for my arrest. You know, there's bills showing up in the mail from ambulance companies that had to, you know, drag me out of some, I mean, all this stuff was, I had community service I'm supposed to do, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, I thought, you know, back up in New Jersey, mom needs some help around the house. I could probably go up and, you know, help mom with painting the house. That's what I'll do. I'll go back up to New Jersey and I'll paint the house. So, so I said, so, hey, I'm home, you know, and she's like, oh, my God. And, and I stayed there probably for the last six years of my drinking. And it got really bleak. What happened was there was a period of time where I had friends and I would leave the house and I'd go do stuff. I'd go to the bar. I'd go to a concert. Or, you know, I mean, I'd get out and I, I'd have fun, I suppose. But as alcoholism progressed, my, uh, my world got smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and it happened incrementally. You know, bits and pieces of, uh, of my world would, uh, would be removed. You know, someone would say something to me. You know how they are. You know, Chris, you know what you did last night? You know, <laughs> no, don't tell me. You know, I said, blackout, don't tell me. And, and so you couldn't see that guy anymore. You know, you know, you, you, I, I called up my boss one time in a blackout and told him I was going to kill him the next day, you know, and I didn't know I did that because it was a blackout. So I walked into work the next day, you know, like, what are you, doing here? you know, yelling at me. I'm like, what? <laughs> you threatened to kill me last day. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> You know, it couldn't have been my fault. So, so I couldn't work there anymore. I mean, you know, those are just a couple of examples of a million things that happened in, in my life, a million breaks in the continuity uh, of a normal life. And, and it got to the point my last three or four years where I, I had a room in the upstairs part of my mother's house. You know, she really couldn't go up and down the stairs very much at that point in time. You know, so I was pretty much left alone up there to do whatever. And I, I was in a relationship with a bottle of bourbon or a, a bottle of vodka. It had gotten to the point where bourbon and, and, and bourbon in the cooler months and vodka in the warmer months. I'm not an animal, you, you know. So, so th that's really what, uh, what, what it ended up. And, and this would be a typical day. I would come to in the morning wearing the clothes that I passed out in the night before. I was a pass outer. I don't know about anybody else. And I'd always pass out sitting at my desk drinking. So just like this, I'd be sitting at a desk and I'd just go out. And I'd slam my head on the hardwood floor, lump myself up, you know, and somewhere in the middle of the night, I'd stagger up and crawl into bed, you know, with a lump on my head. I'm a couple of years into recovery and somebody, you know, I'm telling this story and somebody goes, Chris, you ever hear of throw rugs? <laughs> you know, you got to bang your head on a hardwood floor every single night. Why, you know, put down some wrestling mat or something. You know? but, but, but that's not, that doesn't come into consciousness that I'm going to do that. I don't think I'm going to do that. So, so I come to wearing the clothes that I, I, I passed out of the night before. I stagger into the bathroom. I, you know, I throw some water on my face. I do the vomiting calisthenics. You know, I, crawl, I, I, I go out to my $100 car if I have one, if, if, if my license has been restored. And, and, I, and I go off to my terrible job. I became an electrician somewhere along the line. I, I, th I think it was because uh, you could get away with a whole lot in construction. If you could get the work done, it didn't matter if your eyes were yellow, you, you know what I mean? So, uh, so, so I became an electrician. So I go off to work and, uh, you know, here I am at work shattered because at this point in time, over any considerable period of time, alcoholism gets worse. It does not get better. What does that look like with me? Well, over any considerable period of time, more alcohol needed to go into my body. So I was drinking more in 1989 than I was in 1988. I was drinking more in 1988 than I was in 1987. So it, it was getting progressively uglier. And, uh, and when, you, when you weighed 130 pounds like me, 
and you drank a, a, a fifth to a quart of vodka in a three hour period at night, you, that's not gonna be hangover material. That's gonna be alcohol poisoning material. So I would wake up in the morning with alcohol poisoning. I'd be shattered, and, and, but, but I worked, I worked, you know? So I'd go out to my car and I'd drive off to my job and, uh, and, and it was torture. It was absolute, the amount of, of suffering that the alcoholic can experience is really amazing. People that would feel half that bad, normal people that would feel half that bad would be in the emergency room, you know? But, but you know, I, I, I gotta go to work. And so so it, it's like noon, it's noon. And no, the whole morning I'm swearing to God, I'm never gonna drink again. You know, I, I'm just, I, I mean it. If you had a lie detector and you wrapped it around my wrist, and the polygraph guy goes, Chris, are you going to quit drinking for good and all today? I would have said yes. And that needle would have gone right to true because I meant it with every fiber of my being. But here's what happens. Here's, here's where powerlessness plays in. I get maybe half a sandwich down. I get rehydrated. It's about noon. And, you know, I start to think differently. And, and it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I start to think, you know, I have to sin you made to like completely give up drinking for good and for all that's a pretty strong position to take you know yeah we 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 may we may have to modify that position a little bit you know never drink ever you know that's kind of, that, that's extreme you know and by the time i'm in my car driving home i've already convinced myself that I'm going to go to the liquor store and I'm going to buy a bottle of vodka or a bottle of bourbon. And that's what I do. I get back to my house. I get these big, huge uh, uh, iced tea glasses. They're like 38 ounce glasses. I put some ice in there, pour probably half the quart of bourbon in, a little bit of Coca-Cola and, and I start drinking it. And within an hour, I'm drunk. Within two hours, I'm in a blackout. And within three hours, I'm passed out. So it's like seven o'clock at night, eight o'clock at night. And I'm already unconscious, you know, from drinking too much alcohol. And, you know, the rest of the night is, is, is sheer misery. Now, now, living like that is completely insane. Yet, don't you understand how that happens? Haven't you experienced something like that? You know, that, that's, it, it's, it's just tragic. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tragic illness and it's an unorthodox illness. It, it's not like, you know, having the whooping cough or something, you know, it, it's, it's an illness, but, but it's a self-inflicted illness. But is it really self-inflicted if you're powerless? You know, I, I mean, it's, it's unorthodox. It's a, it's a conundrum. So, so what happens if we're lucky, if we're lucky, we get a separation experience. If we're lucky, we become willing to maybe take some action, you know, to, to try to stop drinking. And, and what I did was I signed myself into a 28 day treatment center. And then when I got out of that treatment center, I signed myself into aftercare and I started to go to some AA meetings. They said, you should probably go to some AA meetings. So I decided I'm going to go to some AA meetings. And on the way to an AA meeting one time, the thought crosses my mind that I'll do, I could do this AA so much better than I'm doing it now. It, you know, and I need to remind myself just how bad it is, you know, being drunk. So if I bought a gallon of vodka and I drank it, it would improve my sobriety. And that's exactly what I did. I bought a gallon of vodka and I drank it to improve my sobriety. And guess what? It didn't work. <laughs> I, I was out for another seven months and it was a brutal, awful seven months. I came crawling into Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, uh, I, I think it was December, 20, I think it was New Year's Eve of 1989. I show up, I show up in a meeting and I'm, I'm absolutely shattered. And, and I started my, my uh, I started my sobriety at that point in time. Now, what did my sobriety look like? Probably for the first six or eight months, all I was able to do was go to meetings. And I've got to tell you, that was not easy. 
every instinct in my body, every thought in my head was telling me, I don't need to do this. You know, there's something good on TV tonight. You know, I'll go to a meeting tomorrow night. I, you know, I have a mind that wants to kill me in early recovery. And, and for one reason or another, it was my, my relapse was just so disgustingly, pathetically painful that, that I had just enough energy, you know, uh, and grace of God uh, to go to a meeting. And I went to a meeting every night, whether I liked it or, or not. And somewhere around six months, I started to feel a shift. I started to feel like maybe I even fit into this AA thing, started to get some friends. I, I even started to like some of the meetings that I went to, you know, found them kind of entertaining. <laughs> you know how we are, we can be entertaining. And, uh, and I, I was staying sober, but I, but I need, I need to tell you that mere sobriety, what that looked like to me was like this. I'd be sitting in a meeting. It'd be a closed-minded discussion meeting. They had a lot of those back then. And, you know, people would be sharing, share, 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 you know, and I'm sitting there. And then I look over and, oh, no, oh, no, he's raising his hand. You, every meeting has this guy, you know what I mean? Oh, please don't call on him. Please don't call him. He, he's a blowhard. Please don't call Oh, and I called on him. Oh, no, no, no. Now I'm going to have him in five minutes. He's going to be talking about his family. Oh, tell somebody who cares. Oh, God. Oh, oh now he's grateful. Oh, that warms my heart that he's grateful. I think I'll go out into the parking lot and slash all four of his tires. And then I'll walk out with him after the meeting just to see what gratitude really looks like. You know? Oh, thank God he's done. Thank God he's done sharing. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> you know, I can't, I, can't, I can't tell anybody these are the kind of thoughts that are going through my head in early sobriety. You'd throw a net over me. You know, you'd have me gassed. You know what I mean? So, so I got to be quiet about this. I got to, you know, I'm keeping it all to myself. Now, that's my sobriety, okay? Hanging on by a thread. Anything could have pushed me over the edge at that period of time. You know, I, I was in the right place at the right time with the right sponsor. But anything could have pushed me over the edge because I'm still powerless. Okay, that meetings didn't give me power. I was still completely, completely insane. So this friend of mine, uh, his name was Radio Shack Mike. You know, everybody had nicknames back then. There was Bummed Out Bob and Herbal Remedy Bill. You know, and I, all these guys. And and Radio Shack Mike. Uh, comes up to me one time and he hands me a set of eight 90 minute cassettes, right? And I go, what are those? And he goes, oh, I, I think you'll like this. I, what is it? He goes, it's a workshop. Oh, I go, workshop on what? He goes, on the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm thinking on the, on the book they give you in treatment? You know, I hadn't opened that book since treatment. And he goes, yeah. I go, well, you know, what, what are they doing? Well, he goes, it's a workshop. He goes, I didn't like it much, but I really think you'll like it. And I go, well, who's doing it? He goes, a couple of guys from Arkansas. I'm like, Arkansas? And then I look at eight 90-minute tapes. I do the math. That's 12 hours. <laughs> you know, I, you know I, I, oh, my God. But he talks me into listening to it. And here's, here's basically what happened. It really, really pisses me off. Uh, the message that they shared came at me like this, Chris, you know, you may be the Pope of the fellowship. You're, you're a meaning maker making it, but you don't have a program. If you're not working the steps as they're laid out in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, you do not have a program because that's what a program is. So when you drink again, please don't tell anybody that AA didn't work because AA is a 12 step program and a fellowship. And if you're not doing the program, that's that's the change agent right there. So, so that's the message I got. But you got to understand, I'm going I'm going to a ton of meetings. Uh, you know, I'm the treasurer over here. I'm, I'm the the chairperson over there. I, I'm driving the boobies from the hatch to the meeting. I'm going out to the diner. I'm going to the slow, painful 
uh, sober dances. I'm doing, I'm doing my job here, you know, and these Joe and Charlie guys are telling me, I don't know a thing. So I get really upset and I throw the tapes off to the side. Now, what happens is <clears throat> you can call it a second bottom. You can, you can call it a lot of things, but the book Alcoholics Anonymous talks about it. And it says that if our spiritual house is not in order, the trials and the low spots ahead are going to be too tough for us to get through. I think all of us have seen relapse. We've seen relapse in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, 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 I understand relapse. The trials and the low spots ahead are not going to be uh, maneuverable, uh, sober, if we don't have our spiritual life in order. So I had listened to these Joe and Charlie tapes, I, and then I got thrown in the barrel. And what that looked like, I had found, uh, I had found uh, God's will for me in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I met her getting off the druggy buggy. You know what I mean? So, so, so here we are, we're, we're like dating and, uh, and it exploded like the Hindenburg. I started to get, I started to get uh, letters from Florida with language in it, uh, like fleeing to avoid prosecution, you know, and, 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 you know, stuff like that. I'm like, oh my God. And then I lose my job. So all three of those things happened in one week. And I remember going over my sponsor's house and knocking on his door. And when he answered the door, Chris, what are you doing here? Because I never just showed up. I couldn't talk. I was so emotionally shot. I just went, uh, 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 you know, I couldn't talk. And so he brought me in, he gave me some coffee, he asked me stupid questions like, do you pray? You know, I'm like, no, you know, and, and he sent me on, on my way. And, and, uh, and it was one of those, it was one of those pivotal periods of time. It was one of those seconds and inches time. What happens with us is insanity or death, you know, uh, the, the skit was about it. what happens with us is many, many times we take our own life, we relapse on alcohol, or we end up in the hatch. You, you know what I mean? Like, we, like, we're just, we just break down emotionally. Uh, sobriety is, is untenable, yet untenable at points in time without some type of recovery. So, so I remembered those Joe and Charlie tapes and I thought, you know, the, the, the information in there had haunted me, had haunted me it, because if you disturb an alcoholic about their alcoholism, this is all to the good. That's a line in working with others. You know, don't be afraid of disturbing an alcoholic because I was disturbed by Joe and Charlie, but what they did was they made me think about certain things. They made me think about my alcoholism. They made me think about recovery. They made me think about the emotional part of sobriety, which I was failing. You, you know what I mean? I was an emotional basket case. So what I did is I, you know, I pulled out the cassette player uh, and I pulled out the tapes again. I blew the dust off of my big book that I hadn't opened since treatment. And, and I started going through the, the 12 steps. Now, uh, I, I do not uh, even pretend to, to, to say that I did a great job on the steps in the be beginning. I, I, I was going through the book, listening to the Joe and Charlie tapes, trying to write out a four step, you know, putting together an amends list, you know, trying to pray and meditate in weird ways and, and trying to help other alcoholics. But, but, but I was doing enough of the 12 step process for my spirit to start to heal. You know, I know one thing, if you're, if you're alcoholic and, and, and you're new, I know one thing, you got a broken spirit. You know, you, you, you're putting on a good face, but you got a broken spirit, you know, because if you let the people down, like we let them down, if you make the mistakes that we make, <clears throat> if, if you just, if you don't show up when you're supposed to show up, you're, you know, it's going to damage, it's going to damage your emotional condition. It's going to damage your spirit an inch at a time. And <clears throat> that's what, that's what happened. I, I was, I was brutalized by, by alcoholism and living life on self-will. And what happened is my exposure to these steps, uh, my, my spirit started to heal. My, 
my emotions started to uh, uh, to come down off of uh, 11, you know, and come down to like seven and six, my, my emotions, uh, you know, I wasn't freaking out as much. I wasn't as pissed off. I wasn't as, as, as anxious about things. Uh, and, uh, and really my, my, my life started to change at that point in time. Now, now, I started to sponsor a bunch of people around this time because I started to sound different in, uh, in the meetings where you share. I, I started to sound different. And, um, you know, people, people were asking me, hey, Chris, whatever you're doing, you know, uh, you, know uh, you, you sound good. You know, would you sponsor me? And I started to sponsor a bunch of guys. And, uh, and they, a lot of them were drinking on me. You, you, you ever have a sponsor drink on you, you know, make you look bad? You know, and some of these guys are making me look bad. And so uh, so I, I came up with this idea. We were going to go over to my house. I bought a little house on a river at this period of time. And it was it was like idyllic and, you know, a little babbler going by with a picnic table. It was perfect for, for like step work. And I brought people over to the house and we would start on the title page and we would go through the big book line by line. And where there were instructions, you know, we would take these instructions in a very imperfect way you know uh which is fine i believe I, i'd rather have you do steps imperfectly than not at all that's for sure but uh uh but all of a sudden I, you know a, a crew of guys started to spring up around me they they later became part of the fellowship of the spirit that it promises us in uh in in a, in a, in a vision for you um they became a, a crew of guys. Uh, the people here's because here's what ha would happen. A lot of the guys would see this step work, this homework, you know, the four step and oh, especially the, the ninth step. They would see that as an overreaction to a problem that, you know, they really had under better control than they had thought. And, uh, and there's somebody at the meeting who just wants him to be the cookie guy, you know? So, uh, Chris, you know, I'm going to have to let you go. You know, Wally just wants, you know, you know, Wally wants me to be the cookie guy. I'm, I'm going to work with Wally. And a lot of people did that. A lot of people did that. A lot of people, you know, moved off the playing field before, uh, before they really got through the steps. And I can honestly say, I don't know where any of them are anymore. You know, this, this is the early nineties, the mid nineties, but I don't know where any of them are. But there were a crew of people who went through the steps, who did a fourth and a fifth step, who went home for an hour, you know, who did stick six and seven, who put together an eight step list, who went out and actually started making amends, uh, under, tried to apply the lessons in steps 10 and 11 and started to work with other alcoholics. And I know where all these guys are now. They're, they're still around, you know, and in one capacity or the other, they're being of service to the world. They're helping other people. They're, they're people who, if you call them up and you're in trouble, they're going to set aside whatever they were doing and they're, they're going to help you. And, you know, that, that's part of uh, this Alcoholics Anonymous. I, you know, I got to tell you, I love Alcoholics Anonymous and I have unbelievable respect for the fellowship, the 12 step program and the service structure in Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's only grown over the years. I celebrated 31 years uh, um, last month. And I can, I can tell you that I love Alcoholics Anonymous more this year than I did last year. And I loved it more last year than I did the year before. The benefits just accrue. You know what I mean? The benefits accrue, but, but I've got to do my job. One of the things that I've seen many, many, many alcoholics uh, do wrong is has to do with consistency. It has to do with consistency. Uh, the, the, the clamors of life, uh, the things that a, a, a sober recovered life will give you are going to be really attractive. And, and they're going to, you know, what can happen is is the, the good job and the, and the good relationship and the nice house and, and all this stuff can start to uh, pull you away from uh, participation in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not, not necessarily saying, you know, meetings. I'm saying 
the spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. Uh, we have a daily reprieve based on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. So there's there's different things that help uh, help us with the participation in the in the maintenance of this spiritual condition. And it can be prayer meditation. It can it can be uh, it can be uh, charitable work. It can be twelve step work with other alcoholics. It, it can be service commitments. It can be at your group. It can be service you know, in the service structure. It can be helping Aunt Fanny, you know what I mean? It can be a lot of things, but, but participation in, in, in a constructive action, action that helps other people. Uh, when, when we're consistent with that, we, you know, we, we really don't have much to worry about. That allows God to do God's job. I believe, uh, I believe that, uh, I believe very, very much in the power of God. There's a great sentence in the 12 and 12. It says, who among us wishes to admit complete defeat? Glass in hand, we've warped our minds to such a state that only an act of divine providence can relieve us of our obsession. So it says something like that. I never get it perfectly right. But only an act of divine providence. Think about that. What is divine providence? Divine providence is the power of God. I believe we can gain access to the actual power of God by working these 12 steps and moving everything out of the way so the sunlight of the spirit can come in. It's like sitting underneath a tree and you, you just pull the leaves off until the sun can come down on you, you know? So, Yes, I need to participate in this recovery process. I need to do my job. I need to do a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. But if I do that, I've, I've participated in the maintenance of my spiritual condition. And the sunlight of the spirit can do the sunlight of the spirit's job. God can do God's job. And I, I believe that so much today. I believe it from my own personal experience. And I believe it, you know, because I've got a lot of experience Working, uh, working with other alcoholics. Now, uh, in this age of Zoom, I got to tell you, I was one of the guys who, when the fourth edition of the book Alcoholics Anonymous came out, and it said, modem to modem, face to face, hey, he's the same everywhere. I flipped out. <laughs> I was, uh, you know, what do you mean modem to modem? You know, are you nuts? And, uh, and you know, they got to change that. You know, there was a whole bunch of us. We got to make them change that. Well, <clears throat> guess what? Guess what? This isn't modem the modem. You know, we're, we're online. But I consider this an AA meeting. I, I go to a ton of Zoom meetings. I got Zoom home groups and, you know, all, I consider it an AA meeting. Now, Am I anxious to get back to face-to-face? -face? Am I anxious to get back to, to, to the commitments at the detoxes and the jails and all that stuff? Yes. Yes, I am. But think about it. Think about it. In a 24-hour period of time, when the world shut down and 99.9% .9 of the AA meetings closed their doors, we found our way onto this platform. We we're, were a little clumsy at first. You know, we, we didn't know how to work Zoom, but that didn't stop us. You know, we are resilient and we can be determined. And I think something inside us drove us. So they were, intuitively, we knew we had to stick together. We've got to stick together. And so Many of us did that on Zoom. There's areas of the country that never shut the meetings down. I'm not in one of them. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, 30 miles outside of New York City and the world shut down. But, but uh, you know, thank God. Thank God for, for this platform. It, there, there's even some great things about Zoom. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of my friends around the country that I would see occasionally, you know, at an AA conference or something, I, I can see them three times a week now. I can go to their home group, you know, and, uh, and, and it's really been cool. And, and I believe, you know, 2020, 2020 is like a marathon. Nobody likes running a marathon. They like having run a marathon. <laughs> you know what I mean? Nobody likes it while you're in it. 
I think 2020 is going to be one of those years where we see we see a big change in Alcoholics Anonymous. We we see a, we see movement forward, especially in other countries, as far as is Alcoholics Anonymous and the quality of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we're going to look, you know, when we get back to meetings, we're going to look back to to the to the Zoom period, you know, and we're going to have some fond thoughts about it. I truly, uh, you know, I, I I truly I truly believe that. You know, what, what is my life like today? I, you know, I, I can't tell you. I've got, I've got great friends. I, I always wanted good friends. I never had them. You know, my friends in my last year of drinking didn't really even have names. You know, they wanted to be anonymous. There was, there was Green Man and Weezer. And there was this guy named Rat, you know, who, who would make sure you understood his name was spelled with two Ts, you know. And these are the guys that I'm drinking and partying with. You know, today, today I, I've got... I've got a ton of friends and I'm really, really blessed. You know, some of these are the greatest, funniest, coolest people to, to be around. You know, my, my life, I went from being a bad electrician to, uh, to actually running pharmaceutical uh, research and development sites and manufacturing sites, if you can imagine such a thing. And it, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like I was trying to do that. I just kept getting promoted because you taught me to show up early, stay late, and ask them if there's anything else that you can do. You taught me to be honest. You know, you taught me to tell them what you're going to do and then do what you told them you're going to do. Simple things like that. Talk about a key to success. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, much, uh, pretty much retired now, but that doesn't mean I'm not busy. I'm part of a lot of different organizations. I'm really involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, you know, I, I, I there's some things that I'm involved with today that, that are just cr just crazy. Uh, you know, there's one of them. I'm just going to share this one of them because I think it's cool because I come from, you know, the 60s and the, the 70s when we were very tune in, turn on, drop out, you know, uh, uh, stay away from the cops, you know, kind of a kind of a background. And today. Uh, I, I've been uh, involved with this group called PTAC, which is the Police Treatment and Community Collaborative. And the cool thing about that is this organization trains police departments to not arrest us. How, how cool is that, you know, to not arrest us? I'm sure, you know, some of us have heard about drug court. And, and by the time you get in drug court, you're already in the system. You know, they already got your fingerprints and everything. What what deflect what PTAC does is teach them to deflect. So if you're driving down the road and you get pulled over with an eight ball of coke and and you know a half empty bottle of vodka, you know the pol the police departments understand that you've probably got a substance abuse problem if they've been trained right. And let's just navigate this guy to the Betty, you know it. it and if it's if you got to go to the Betty, you got to go to the Betty, you know, so so the so the cop will do something like this. Treatment or or jail, uh, what would you like? And they become navigators to navigate people like us into different pathways toward health. It can be treatment, counseling, you know, one of there's a million different pathways. Alcoholics Anonymous is not the only thing in the world, but uh but how the hell did I get involved with something like that? You know, I, I never wanted anybody to know where I lived, <laughs> you know? So, so, so life, life has really taken on uh, new meaning. And, and there's so many promises in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, that I have personal experience with. Uh, some of the greatest promises, I think, are no matter what your present circumstances, you'll live in a new and wonderful world. Uh, the most satisfactory years of your existence lie ahead of you. you know, there's, there's just a ton of promises in there that are absolutely extraordinary. And I want to tell you that AA, AA, at its core, what it's designed to do is to allow us, through a process, allow us to gain access to the actual power of God that can do in us and through us what we cannot do for ourselves. And it's, 
it's almost an unlimited benefit and quality of life that can happen from that. They don't even tell you that in church, <laughs> you know, that you're going to gain access to God. But, but you know, you see it. You, we can see the change. We can see somebody stagger into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous absolutely, absolutely bankrupt in every way they can be bankrupt. And six months, a year, two years later, we can see a new person, right? What is that? What is that? But divine providence, you know? I am so grateful to be here today. Thank, thank, thank you all for, uh, for showing up and sticking with me here. This is a wonderful conference. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm particularly fond of kazoo playing, you know, so this was, this was special for me. And, uh, and uh, my name is Chris. I'm an alcoholic. Thanks for letting me share.